Hello and welcome to the Healthy Directions Understanding Your Biometrics webinar. My name is Julia Wilkins. I'm a part of the health management team at Health New England. And in this session, we're going to go over your biometrics, which you probably just got done at a kickoff event or a health screening, and find out what they're telling you. We're going to go over what the values mean, why they are what they are, and how you can change them if needed. So first, let's establish what a biometric is. We use metrics every day in our lives to measure things. And a biometric is just another measurement that's biological or biochemical about us. And their specific measurements help us better understand our health. So we know what a biometric is, but why are they so important to us? Well, the reason why they're so important is because these metrics measure what is personal to us. These are measurements that are only belong to our body. They can help us know where we are in terms of our health, as well as enlighten us to ways on how we can improve our health. So we're gonna go over the different biometric values you may have learned about yourself at your most recent health screening. The first metric is probably one that you've heard of a lot. It's BMI, or Body Mass Index. And what BMI is, is a number that is a height-weight ratio. It's a quick and very helpful tool that can help estimate how your weight is affecting your health right now. Now, how is BMI calculated? How do we get this number? It's an equation that you can see on your slide using your weight and height. So your weight in pounds is divided by your height in inches, and then those inches are squared and multiplied by 703. The 703 helps in converting that number from a metric system to the English system, which we use in the United States. So let's look at an example of how you would calculate someone's BMI. Our example person is going to be Jack, and Jack weighs 220 pounds and is six foot three. So first we're gonna convert his height into inches, which makes it to be 75 inches. Next, we're gonna square those inches or multiply them by themselves to get 5,625. So then we're gonna take his weight at 220 and divide it by that 5,625. And when we do that, we get 0 0.0391. We multiply that 0 0.0391 by the 703, and this is how we get Jack's BMI of 27.48, and we'll round that up to 27.5. And now we can figure out what 27.5 means to Jack. There are recommended ranges for BMI, just like with any other metric. You can see on the chart what BMI ranges mean. A normal BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9. So if we take Jack's BMI of 27.5, we see that it puts him in the overweight category. BMI is determined what's considered a healthy number through many, many studies. These studies compare BMI levels with specific health outcomes over time. And what has been found is that the greater your BMI, the greater your chance of having a stroke, getting heart disease, having high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, or different types of cancer. So that's why it's important to know this number and see if you're at risk for these certain diseases. Body composition or body fat percentage is another biometric you had done. How this is different from BMI is that BMI just looked at your height and weight. Body composition looks at what percentage of your body is made up of fat. Now fat sounds like it's a negative thing, but we actually need fat on our body to survive. And the purpose of fat is to give us energy, to store energy. The calories that we consume through eating foods are units of energy. So if you were to compare calories and a pound of fat, about 3,500 calories makes up one pound of fat. That's really a lot of energy. To kind of show you what that means, one pound of fat can give a 150 pound man enough energy to walk 35 miles with just that one pound. The problem with fat is that some of us carry too much 
while others don't carry enough. And we'll learn about those ranges coming up. So how is body fat percentage calculated? There are three ways. And at your screening, a bioelectrical impedance was probably used. This is based on the fact that the bioelectrical current that moves through your body moves more quickly through lean muscle than through fat. So if you use a handheld device and a scale to measure body fat, these tools are sending out signals on one side of the device and then returning the signal on the other side of the device. The amount of time the signal takes to get to the other side of the body measures the body fat percentage value in combination with age, gender, and your weight. Another technique is a skin full thickness test with calipers. The picture on your screen shows what a caliper looks like. So it measures the thickness of your skin folds taken in various parts of your body and then a calculation is made to determine your body fat percentage. This method is more accurate than the bioelectrical impedance but it's more invasive and time consuming. The third way to measure body fat percentage is underwater weighing. This is the most accurate measurement, although inconvenient. A person is weighed outside of the water, and then they go into a water tank, let out all their air, and then get completely submerged into water. They are then weighed underwater. Again, a calculation is then made to figure out the body fat percentage. As you can see, the reason we do bioelectrical impedance at a screening is that it's much more convenient and quicker. Recommended body fat percentage ranges can be seen on this chart. And as you may notice, there are different ranges for males and females. Males naturally carry less fat on their body than women. Also, as our body ages, we naturally have more fat, and this is normal. But this chart shows wherever you are what is considered as low, normal, high, and very high levels. You want to aim for being in the normal range, but the good thing is that if you're in a range that you're not really satisfied with, there are things you can do to change that. Triglycerides. Triglycerides were measured when you had your blood drawn at the screening. What triglycerides are, are fats. They are the main form of fat in the body, and they are the end byproduct of meal digestion, and it gets put into our blood. And what are these triglycerides used for? Well, they're used in the same way as fats in general. They're stored in the body for energy, whether in that moment or we're using that energy later. The problem with triglycerides is when we consume excess levels. What we don't need or use gets accumulated in various parts of the body, and over time we get high levels that rest in the blood. It's important to know your triglyceride level because high levels above the recommended ranges have been linked to high risk of stroke, heart disease, and heart attack. So what are these recommended numbers? Well, you can see them on your screen. So if you creep into the borderline high or high ranges, you're increasing your risk of the diseases we just talked about. So step one is learning your numbers, but then you wanna to talk to your physician if needed about how to manage these numbers. Cholesterol is another biometric value you received and that was measured through the blood draw. Cholesterol is a waxy fat-like substance that's produced in our body by the liver and other cells. We also get cholesterol from food that we consume. So about 75% of the cholesterol in our body is produced by the liver and other cells. That's genetic, but 25% comes from what we eat, so that's what we can control. Sometimes cholesterol gets a bad rap, so why is cholesterol important? We may think we need to avoid cholesterol, but our body can't function without it. Without it, we would be very sick. However, excess levels can build up in our arteries and potentially cause heart disease, stroke, and other health issues. When we break down cholesterol, we usually hear about certain types like HDL and LDL. So what do these types mean? Well, HDL stands for high density lipoprotein and LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. And lipoproteins are substances that carry cholesterol around in the blood. And LDL is what we refer to as bad cholesterol. It comprises the majority of our body's cholesterol 
and high levels can be associated with buildup in our arteries, which causes heart disease. HDL is called the good cholesterol. It's been shown to absorb LDL or that bad cholesterol and carry it back to the liver for excretion and get it out of the body. You actually want higher levels of HDL because it's associated with reduced risk of heart disease and stroke. So it does the opposite of what LDL would do. Here you can see the optimal ranges for both HDL, LDL, and total cholesterol. Take a look at your numbers and see if they're within the healthy range. If you find you need to manage these numbers better, talk to your physician. Since 75% of cholesterol is produced in the body, we may be predisposed to having higher cholesterol levels. That's something else that you can talk to your physician about to see if there's a family history issue or not. But you can always try to control the 25%, which is based on lifestyle choices. Blood pressure is another measurement taken at the health screenings, and usually your doctor will take it whenever you have a visit with them, or you can get it done at a local pharmacy or grocery store. But what is blood pressure? Well, blood pressure is the amount of pressure you have in your blood vessels. It's measured in milliliters of mercury, or MMHG. And you'll also see it written out in two numbers. There's a top number and a bottom number, which is the systolic and diastolic values. Systolic is the top or first number that represents the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart beats. So when your heart is pushing blood into your vessels. Diastolic, or the bottom or second number, is the pressure in your vessels when your heart is at rest. So after your heart beats, it rests for a second, and that's what the diastolic number is. These two numbers in combination are important because high blood pressure can put you at risk for heart disease and stroke. It's also super important to know your blood pressure value because high blood pressure is known as the silent killer. One out of every three American adults have high blood pressure and most of them don't even know it. There's no symptoms of high blood pressure until you have an episode, until you have a heart attack or a stroke. So that's why you need to know what your range is and work with your doctor if it's high. You will know it's too high if you are out of the normal range on the chart that you see. Blood pressure can change throughout the day or over time. So if you're having an issue with blood pressure, it's a good idea to track it to make sure you're in a healthy spot. Blood sugar or glucose was another measurement in the blood draw. Glucose is the type of sugar that enters our body through carbohydrates that we consume. So when we eat carbohydrates, they are digested and then they release glucose into the blood. It's the main form of energy in the body, so it's important that we have glucose, but we also need to make sure that we maintain healthy levels. Our body maintains glucose with insulin that comes from the pancreas. This prevents glucose levels from getting too high. When the pancreas isn't working properly or isn't releasing insulin properly, glucose levels can get too high, and this is a possible sign of diabetes. What happens when these glucose levels are too high over time and consistently, the high blood glucose levels can damage cells in your body like the eyes, kidneys, nerves, and blood vessels. So this is another reason why it's important to get your levels checked. If you check your blood regularly or you see on your sheet from the screening a glucose number, the recommended values are shown here you will see that there's fasting values and non-fasting values. Most likely, if you get your blood drawn at a health fair or screening, this will be a non-fasting number. A doctor may ask you to fast before a blood test, and you'll know that this is the fasting number. So now that you know all your numbers, what should you do with them? The first step is to talk with your physician. If your numbers are in a healthy range, continue to watch them to prevent from them changing to abnormal levels. If they're out of range, then you can get advice on how to manage them with lifestyle changes that aren't related to genetics. A lifestyle change you can make is getting physically active. The CDC recommends 150 minutes per week of physical activity for a person. That's about 30 minutes five days a week. 
And remember, you can spread out those 30 minutes into 10 minute increments throughout the day. You don't have to do it all at once. Also, practicing good nutrition is really important. Fruits and vegetables and proper portions of carbohydrates, protein, and dairy all play an important role in managing health. You can check out more about nutrition at choosemyplate.gov. So we hope you enjoyed this webinar and were able to gain some knowledge about your specific health numbers and how you can always improve them. There were a lot of metrics and numbers in this webinar, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the health management team at Health New England by emailing us at healthydirections at hne.com. We hope this webinar helped you to continue your life's journey in a healthy direction. Thank you and take care.